everybody. Welcome to another episode of Politically Depressed. As always, I'm your host, Eamon McAdam. So I'm recording today, 13th of June, Thursday, and I'm feeling kind of not good, but better than I have been in a while. And I don't know if it's a temporary thing, and I'll probably be really depressed on Saturday and unable to move, but I do think I've hit some sort of new insights that might, I don't know, I wanted to share them with you while I'm still feeling this way. Uh, Because I do think actually I see things a little bit differently. Or, I don't know, again, maybe that's just the kind of serotonin dopamine rush that for some reason I'm experiencing at the moment and it's just fleeting. But either way, before I start today's episode, just a few announcements. If you appreciate this podcast and have liked the episodes that I've been doing, please consider supporting this podcast, and you can do so in a number of ways. You can become a member of our Patreon. Uh, Politically Depressed is part of the network from the periphery, and becoming a member of the Patreon, which you can do for as little as like $5 a month, gets you a lot of access to like exclusive content, invitation to our monthly hangout. It's pretty cool. And otherwise, there's the tip jar for one-time donations, and if you're not able to pay, then you can still support this podcast by sharing it with your friends and family, or by leaving a review or rating wherever you listen to the podcast. It just takes a few steps, and it really helps this podcast sort of break through the algorithm, which honestly has been really hard to break through, because, I don't know, I'm shadow banned as hell on Twitter and Instagram, and I don't fuck with Blue Sky... Mastodon seems cool, but I can't be bothered learning a new platform. So, yeah. Also, huge shout out to everybody who reached out uh, with birthday wishes. Really appreciate it. I am now starting my fourth decade on this cursed planet. And hopefully, by the time I'm celebrating my fifth decade, things might be a bit better. But that's pretty wishful thinking. Anyway, so... I woke up today to videos of Israeli soldiers using a trebuchet to send firebombs to the south of Lebanon, using arrows, using like really primitive basic things from literally 800 years ago to cause fires, to contribute to the ecocide that they have been enacting for the last eight months in southern Lebanon. And it's barbaric, but I think There's something kind of nice about them just really revealing who they are, who we have known them to be always, but now with social media, with their complete kind of delusion in, you know, they've posted these videos. I mean, the lack of accountability that comes with all this, that they know that they can post it themselves and nothing will happen to them. But I don't know, at the very least, there's a silver lining of like, We've always known them to be barbarians. We've always known them to be fascists. And now it's just ludicrously clear for all to see. At the same time, I also saw a lot of posts on Twitter of things that I've seen before, but now with the kind of rising of escalations in the south and threats to invade southern Lebanon or to increase their operations... I've been seeing things that people are writing, calling for the complete destruction of Lebanon, just so casually. I saw someone post a picture of Leb- of Beirut and writing, this is the before picture, the after picture will come soon. You know, just clear genocidal language, like, so fucked up. And again, I'm kind of used to these things. It doesn't come as a shock. I've seen these types of posts for years. Indeed, some of this, like, escalatory language, you know, it was like just a few years ago, I think Lieberman, some whatever, who we don't really hear much about. Everyone's focused on Netanyahu and Smotrich and Ben Gvir, but it really is, like, almost every, you know, Israeli Jewish politician is a genocidal fascist piece of shit. And yeah, they talk about sending Lebanon back to the Stone Age and threatening to do to Beirut what they've done to Gaza. Why have I started today's episode with this, especially since I started off by saying that I feel relatively good today? Well, 
partly it's the fact that these didn't affect me as much as they would have only a few days ago. And again, I'm constantly hesitant about ascribing kind of bigger explanations to something that could just be, you know, I was super depressed over the weekend and now I have an up phase and I'm going to go down again. So I don't want to create some sort of analysis to be like, aha, I am seeing the light now and I figured it all out. But I don't think it is just a kind of temporal, you know, a cycle. I do think I'm developing kind of manic depressive symptoms where I have been really going up and down, you know, and I have a few days of complete downs and a few days where like, I kind of feel like I've overcome the downs and now I'm fine, but I don't know. I'm definitely never going to be fine while Gaza burns, while the Israelis threaten, you know, while Lebanese fascists go around the streets. Like, there's too much to count. Too many reasons why I am incredibly depressed, why I've created this podcast called Politically Depressed. But there are a couple of things that come to mind. A few days ago, when I was messaging my mother and telling her that I was feeling incredibly depressed and anxious and just kind of falling into despair, she sent me a message which, I don't know, I don't think she really was aware of how powerful what she said to me was, that she was writing something new. I mean, I can't really understand it myself why it affected me so much. But here's what she said to me. She said, I hope the light in you pulls you back to us when you hit a low. I don't know, there's something so beautiful about that, where she sort of identifies something within me that'll pull me back up. But also this language of back to us. And I don't know, there's something that gets really dark when I find myself in these phases. Like, literally, the lights around me fade. I become very insular. And it is just me and the world. There's no interface. There's no one else. Sometimes I even feel like I cease to exist in those moments, you know, very depersonalized, whatever. And so to constantly hold the fact that there are those around me who love me, who are themselves lights in my life and in the world, and they're there for me, and they're waiting for me. Actually, I wanted to talk more about this before then bringing up a separate point, but that exact sentence really ties it together, really forms like a powerful segue I did not expect. But another reason that I feel like I've hit a kind of new way of thinking and hit on something that I've kind of trying to internalize and really understand is from a short story letter from Gaza uh, by Hassan Kenafani, which for those who noticed, I had done a reading of in my latest episode. My first time doing a kind of reading like this, for this podcast that is, and definitely something I'm going to continue to do. But we initially watched this, we as in the Palestine Watch Party, uh, last Sunday, watched John Berger read the same short story in a small video, like 20 minutes. And there's something incredibly, incredibly powerful about that short story. Painfully relevant, even though it was written in 1956, right? But it does end on a very similar note to that message my mother sent me only a few days ago. You know, come back to us. We are waiting for you. I don't know, I think there's other things in that short story as well that have been kind of replacing some of the thoughts I've been having. But I don't know, I think I really needed to hear that. Not just from my mother, but from Hassan Kanafani. And I think, you know, reading this, and the more I read of Hassan Kanafani, the more I read not of him, but by him, the more I continue to understand why he is so venerated, you know? Why he has held such a strong place in history. So, yeah, I don't know. What I've been feeling these days, the last, like, two or three days, basically, 
after the short story, after the message from my mother, a sort of new momentum, a new kind of inertia. One thing that I certainly lack in my life, and I think this is a major theme in all of our lives, I lack meaning. I lack purpose. The only meaning I've ever been able to like really prescribe to myself or attribute to my life is a kind of one of social justice, is one where it's like, I, I want to alleviate suffering. I want to contribute to whatever. But given the state of things and how horrible things are, it feels really difficult for that still to be my meaning, you know? It just constantly feels like I'm failing at the thing that I've prescribed for myself to do. Just for the sake of it, the reason that I'm talking about meaning in this way is because my first, let's say, foray into philosophy, into just thinking about stuff, is existentialism. And keen listeners of this podcast will know I've never grown up with a god or with a strong sense of religion. And so existentialism, when I first discovered it at like the age of 15, hit so powerfully because I had no meaning. I had no narrative. I had no path in life that's, you know, set out in these religious texts, but also in the kind of history of it all. I never had a heaven that I thought I was going to go to, you know, or a righteous path or any of these things. And so I have very strongly always believed that there is no inherent meaning to life. We are born into a meaningless world. But I am not a nihilist. I am not a cynic. I don't believe then that therefore we should all just kill ourselves, or that indeed there is no meaning. Here, I like Albert Camus. I don't like him for other reasons, but in terms of his analysis of the absurd, which is that exact kind of contradiction between our desire for meaning and the lack of meaning in the world. For him, the answer to this is to accept and to create our own meaning, right? Here he uses the kind of idea of Sisyphus, this man who is condemned for eternity to roll a boulder over a hill only for it to fall back down again the other side. Um, he says we must imagine Sisyphus happy, right? And so naturally then, with my interest in psychology, um, the book that I think was one of the most formative things I've ever read, uh, that actually kind of features in the cover photo of this podcast, is Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. The book is part Holocaust memoir. Viktor Frankl was an Austrian Jew who was a psychoanalyst, uh, and was condemned to the concentration camps, to Auschwitz. He survived, and he wrote this book. It's an incredible story. It's unbelievable, because when he gets captured by the Nazis, he has his manuscript taken away from him. The manuscript is about a new way of understanding psychotherapy, of understanding psychoanalysis, premised on meaning. You know, his basic thesis is that most anxiety stems ultimately from a lack of meaning, uh, most complexes, rather. And so while he's in Auschwitz, while he's in these concentration camps, although he acknowledges 90, 95% of the reason that some people survived and some didn't was down to pure luck, that 5 or 10% he attributed to hope. What he would do is that he would, since his manuscript was taken away from him, he would rewrite his manuscript on anything he could get his hands on, on a piece of tissue, on a toilet paper, on a fabric. And he believes that within that 5 to 10%, that he was able to survive because he needed to get out and publish this work. And half of what the book is, is that work, right? This is also making me think of Sahab Shado another incredible figure who survived, I think, 10 years of torture in an Israeli prison in South Lebanon. It wasn't an Israeli prison, but it was a Zionist prison by Lebanese collaborators. Different story. But regardless, 
So, yeah, I've always been really drawn to this idea, right? He developed, Viktor Frankl developed this idea, logos therapy, meaning-centered therapy. And maybe that's what I need to find. But it seems like most logotherapists that are found in the city only speak German. And all the English-speaking ones all do CBT, which is a whole different conversation. But I don't know, I think going back to this idea of the light within me bringing me back to my mother, and in the case of Kenafani's short story, there's a kind of meaning that's attributed to taking care of those we love and those that love us, of being there for them. And unfortunately for us in the region, taking care of our mothers taking care of our friends and our comrades and our communities means confronting these incredibly violent, intense systems of Zionism, of Western imperialism, of fascism, of Arab nationalism, of sectarianism. And this is why it is so difficult to separate for me the personal and the political. But I think reframing it, you know, It's not, I want to destroy the Zionist state for X and Y, but I I need to destroy it because otherwise it will kill my mother. It will kill those that I love. It will kill those who are waiting for me. And without them, I'm nothing. And so I think thinking it in that way gives me a kind of energy. And I feel like, I need energy these days because I've noticed that my depression completely correlates with a stagnation, with I don't move, you know? And so today, feeling good, I I walked faster. I walked with intention. I got up, I went to the store, and I didn't think twice. I didn't sit there and think, oh, but I don't feel like it. No, I just got up and went. And I don't know, there's a feeling of living better out of spite, you know? out of spite to all the fucking assholes who would rather I be dead, and if not, then living in despair and and uh, miserable and stuck in my own grief to the point that I cannot resist in any meaningful way. And so, I don't know, I want more of that. Not out of anger, not out of hatred, but out of love. And a love that drives me forward and drives me towards those who deserve it, you know? I don't know. I feel good. I feel like if I really absorb those ideas and those feelings and the things that I'm reading from my mother, from, you know, incredibly old texts that still live on so powerfully like Kenafan is, I feel like it'll give me a new sort of respite from this depressive malaise I found myself in because something needs to change. And I see this in so many people. Something needs to change because at the pace we're going, we're all going to get burnt out. We're all just going to continue to be so depressed that we become incapable of doing anything, let alone resisting the forces of white supremacy, of imperialism, of Zionism, of capitalism, of patriarchy. Like, I don't want to put these all together. Well, I can, and it's just that's just bell hooks. But anyway, so I don't know. I do hope that this sort of analysis that I've been developing, or that I'm kind of like reflecting on, I hope that really is something that continues to power me. Not saying that I'm not going to have depressive spells or like allow myself for the inertia to slow down a bit for me to have these moments where I just can't do anything for a few hours that I can just sort of, I don't know, be sulky, but have the ability that after the sulk, after the crying, after the, you know, laying down not doing anything completely inert for hours, that I can get back up, that I have something that will get me back up, that is within me, but pulling out towards something else. And I think that's a very good description of love. Anyway, 
I hope this episode wasn't too sentimental. Well, I don't know. All of it's very sentimental, I guess. But I hope it wasn't too... Meh. I don't know what I'm afraid of. But either way, uh, I think I'm going to wrap it up there. This has been another episode of Politically Depressed. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, please consider supporting this podcast either by becoming a member of our Patreon, leaving a small donation in the tip jar below, or just leaving this podcast a rating or review wherever you're listening to it. And that's it from me. I'll see you all next time.